This is Ryan, it's Tuesday, I'm pushing the button. Yippee! Woo! <laughs> Putting our guest to work already. I um, love having her here. Thanks, Diane. Let's see. All right. Hi. Hi, everybody. Hi, hello, Mrs. Wright. Hello. Welcome back. Get some of that echo out of here. All right. We're back in the old late night playset. Welcome back, everybody at home. Tonight is Tuesday, December 10th, 2019. My name is Jay Ryan. This is Nicole Ryan. We are the Ryans. And tonight's guest on the show is a good friend of ours, Diane Caffaretta. Uh, I don't know how far we go back. Four or five years is what I'm thinking from when we bought the yellow car and we met you almost immediately. Uh, at least far that bet we get to, there's PCA time. There's, were you in the Porsche Owners Club as well? Mm-hmm. Yep, so there's time there as well. All right, she's going to be in here in a little bit. We're going to talk about Porsches. We're going to talk about racing, all sorts of stuff. Actually, anything you want to talk about. <laughs> and, and nothing you don't. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, uh, Mrs. Ryan, welcome back. How are you? You look so pretty. Saturdays and Sundays. Here it is Tuesday. Thank you. I'm fine. Feeling the weekend still? Uh, yeah, I'm learning to rest differently. It's great. Well, that's, there's a lot of stuff. We've, we had a big full weekend, which a lot of people probably know about because we saw a lot of people. Um, but uh, people probably don't know that you went out on a limb and tried something new yesterday. You actually tried a new, different... I don't want to say doctor. Would you say doctor? A medical, a new thing, trying something new. A new, new. path of, of fixing me. A new path, yeah. Uh, it's existing. It's normal, but it's not typical. It's not stereotypical. Um, it's a chiropractor that specializes in post-concussion disorder, kind of. And that's where we align, really, is that's what MS is. It's a bunch of symptoms of post-concussive there you go. You stuff. found somebody in the medical field, ancillarily, who does believe what you believe, which a lot of this stuff is trauma-based and um, and, and drama-based <laughs> stuff yeah. from, from childhood even, and yeah. certainly maybe from your hockey days. Definitely, and it goes way further back. I mean, one of his first questions was, did, did you get dropped in your head? And, uh, it's a probably. fair question. People think it's a joke. Cause, oh, somebody's so dropped on their head when they're a kid. But it's fully true. It's fully true. Fully true. Totally possible. And my answer is, I don't know, because my family and everyone I know lives in that age of, like, you don't talk about stuff like that. Also, because you never know. Kids like, were rubber back then. You just drop one, you pick it up. I mean, it's 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 just how it was. And like I told him, I they swam. They smoked and drank during pregnancy and everything back then, too. It was it not was an issue. fine. And, like, I dove in. Now they're, like, diving in water causes concussions. I'm like, he asked Diving, me about, swimming swimming and hockey. he's like, did you get dropped? I'm like, I don't know. I played hockey and I swam and I danced and fell on hard wood floors a lot. Like, I don't know where it comes from, but like, I know that I helped. I'm not innocent in my body. Like I drank like a fish. I did not take care of myself for years. All that means is I can fix it. So now I know how to do that. And I found someone that can help me do that. Awesome. It's great. Just Love it's a it. lot of different kinds of work, but it's good. And he but knows. Shout out to Doctor Ben. Huge shout out to Doctor Ben. Thank awesome. you. Something new. So we'll we'll keep checking in on you there. Okay. But I can tell that uh, the moment you came back, your your brain was uh, much more alert, more present, more aware. Really. Less foggy. Yeah. And then I told you too. You looked like you had been adjusted, which you hadn't been, but your body was much looser. You were not nearly as rigid, and the rigidity is is what kind of makes you. Yeah. It, like I, t- he gave me a little bit of hope that I haven't had in a while, it, it, so that speaks volumes for the rest of it. It's awesome. I'm gonna thank thank you for sharing that, and I'm gonna thank Diane for my glasses because now I can see you while you told me. <laughs> uh, okay, Mrs. Ryan, there's a couple things. The weekend uh, we've got a video for, so we, instead of talking about it, we may as well just play it if that's awesome. all right. Yeah. Um, we did a little bit of everything. There was Breakfast Club, there was Porsche Experience Center, and um, Halibut, I guess. All right. Roll it, Hal. Let's see where we were this week. I 
Toast my goal! That's right. Yeah, yeah, the star of the show. What's going on? Did you like it? That was awesome. It was a fun weekend. It was a busy, full recap. I noticed a couple things, and there were a couple pictures that clearly were not from this weekend, but they were found <laughs> uh, this weekend. One was you and Dak Shepard, because we talked about it on the show last week. He's one of the new hop, uh, new hosts of the new Top Gear USA, Top Gear America, whatever. Sure. Uh, and you used to work with him, of course. And then there was another one from Emmy Night, where you and Rob Corddry, the other new host of Top Gear America USA, uh, you had actually, uh, you guys had won an Emmy that night. That was the first yeah. one, I believe. Not yeah. the first one ever, first one for that show. First one for Children's Hospital. Yeah. It was great. And I just read news about the pro one of the producers of that show today. Like, oh, cool. Got a Good deal. stuff. Like, yeah. Awesome. Like, that was that was really fun, and those were the, some good old days of when you used to we used to own the company, and you were really really working hardcore. Um, but what I <laughs> couldn't help but notice in that picture was the, uh, the I'm just you guys are all dressed up because you've just been to the Emmys. You have an <laughs> Emmy with you. We're at the Biltmore downtown, like celebrating and everything in the Oak Bar, and you were like, "Come on down!" I'm like, I was in a garage building a time machine with, a, with somebody, and it was like, "I'm really not dressed for it." You're like, "No, it doesn't matter. Come on down." Pretty pretty funny. Sharing it, holding an Emmy with all of you guys, and it's pretty fun. It, Although it was, Cheers won its fair share of Emmys, I believe, so maybe it's not that far off. It was a, it was the post celebration, so yeah. all welcome. So fun! <laughs> I just remember all the girls had kicked off. There was a pile in the corner underneath the curtains of high heels. All the high heels were over there, and all you yeah. guys was just kind of having a good time. It was a fun night. Uh, so yeah, so I can't wait for the new Top Gear with a bunch of people you used to work with. That'll be fun. Me too. Um, so Mrs. happy for them. Mrs. Ryan, the only last thing I have to do is uh, East Coast feed. Okay. It's it's not new. I believe it's actually from before last week, but but we didn't get to it. So let us take a look. Check in with Coraline. Oh, oh. TBT's not right. <laughs> there it is, East Coast <laughs> feed. Uh, I believe we're Coraline and Daddy. Let's see where we are. Hi, Jay Nicole. Say hi. East Coast feed. Tell them. East Coast feed. East Coast feed. <laughs> Mr. and Mrs. Ryan. <laughs> We're sitting here going to bed, and we're reading. We read a book every night because that's our pinky promise, right, Coraline? Right. And tonight we're reading "I Am a Princess" from Star Wars, and in it is Jabba the Hutt, right? What does Jabba the Hutt say? Can you tell Jay? Blub blub blub. We know how much you love that, Jay. That was it. We thought of you tonight while reading our book, and want to say some random love. Love you guys. See you later. Bye. Ah. Uh. Gotta love that kid. Yeah. So the joke there, of course, was I'm not a Star Wars guy, as, as everyone who knows me knows. Um, I know that's kind of really weird in this day's uh, landscape. But 
having not grown up with the movies, it's just it's always escaped me. You see the stuff I'm into, cars and other nerdery things. Um, but so whenever uh, I think I don't know, this probably happened one time, but because it was so funny to him, he's latched onto it for life. <laughs> I said, uh, what's the name, you know, the big guy, the blah, 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 you know, the big uh, blah, 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 I'm going to get you, blah, blah, blah. And he was like, what are you talking about? And finally, we got to Jabba the Hutt, so forever he is permanently linked, you know, Jabba the Hutt, you know, blah, 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 which, of course, he doesn't say at any point in the movie. <laughs> so that's one of those things where it's become a thing, and it's not funny to anybody else, but to the two, the two here, I remember the day he was like, <laughs> I love the noise he makes. But, 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 you saw the new uh, Star Wars ride, and neither one of us care about that stuff yeah. at all, but it looked amazing. It does look it amazing. Looks ama- it looks like you're in the movie. It does look pretty fantastic. And I'm just going to say, uh, dear Cass, I got Coraline some books when she was still uh, not born yet, so feel free to pull those out if you're reading books all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's a train one in there. Oh, I see. It's a little more apropos than Star Wars. <laughs> I guess maybe for our life, but for his kid, I think Star Wars is where it's at. Yeah. You know? Yeah, Lives I, it, breathes it. You, you're probably right. It's part of the forest and everything. I'm a all princess, right. <laughs> I think that title was. I'm all in. Mrs. Ryan, it's time to ask the question that's on everyone's mind. <laughs> What's going on, Mrs. Ryan? I'm a princess too. Um, chickpeas are the new health food. Oh, it's not new. Let's hear it. Garbanzo beans they're to being, the rescue. Okay, they're nutrient dense. They're high in protein, so they're being looked at as an additive for a lot of things. Like Jessica Seinfeld puts uh, spinach and brownies. Like you oh, can sure. put, chick- it's neutral enough that you can put it in a lot of foods. Agreed. So uh, you can get kind of yeah whatever you can get kind of a creamy paste out of it. Yeah, you can use the the juices as a substitute for egg whites. I wow, did not know that. Yeah, so there's lots of useful utilities for chickpeas. So I just grew up with them and love them. It's one of the few veggies I could just eat out of a can. Sounds gross, but. You know what I mean? Like I don't mind. I don't mind them. It doesn't bother me. It's not like eating veggies to me. I used to eat them with uh, canned uh, mushrooms and uh, French dressing from the okay, salad bar in college. Thing. It's that's a whole different thing. Chickpeas are pretty good. <laughs> like, yeah, the, with, with with ranch and and everything else. No, sure. it was French dressing. It's not ranch. It wasn't creamy and gross. It's still gross. <laughs> but I'm not defending it. my college. Oh, I was gonna wear my sweatshirt. So speaking of college years, Donna. Uh, it's white. Michigan. Yeah. Uh, I love it, but it's white and it doesn't work on camera. Oh, well, whatever you, if you want, we, whatever. But I yeah, mean, right. I wear it out a lot. It'll be in a lot of photos, but I told you I would wear it on the show and I realized it's Oh, it's the morning, new one you just received? I, yeah. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. It's, it's warm as shit, but, uh, and I love it, but I'm not going to wear it on camera, but I'll say your name anyway. Thanks so much. Um, okay. The, there, uh, it, it, Apples communicate like the chemical they release is ethylene. You probably know that. Like, if are we talking about apples, the fruit, like the natural fruit yes. on trees? No, go ahead. Uh, okay, part of the ripening process of fruit, some fruits and vegetables, apples being notable for this, sure. is that it releases ethylene, and that's a way that uh, apples chemically communicate to other apples wow. and other fruit that it's time to ripen. So, wow, like, hey, everybody, we're going to do this. Yeah, wow. it's time. So there, a way to reduce waste, it's been found out at the University of Pennsylvania, shout out to them, my uncle <laughs> went there, um, is to monitor that process. And so they've created little ways to do that, to monitor the a- ethylene uh, discharge, I guess. Basically, we're, uh, we're bugging the apples. The apple areas? Yeah. Yeah, we are. Uh, does, it, it, there's positives and negatives like with everything, but uh, it could potentially save a lot of waste of foods and stuff. In my mind, I'm thinking they're going to figure out whatever this thing is and then be able to synthesize it some other way. And like, look, we can ripen fruit whenever we want to. I think that's it's already crazy. happening. And I it's think like another the veil- version of GMO almost. I think that's already happening because they transport fruit before it's ripe and then they let it ripen indoors. Versions and stuff. of that already happened. Yeah, so right. this is a way to pull the veil back and be like, listen, this is happening, but here and here's how. But mm-hmm. let's be more aware of what's going on. You find the most interesting stuff. Thanks. That's wild. Um, there is an infinity owner in Canada, in Quebec, or uh, 
an infinity dealership bought a Tesla for the mayor of this town in Quebec who only buys infinities and wanted an electric vehicle. Okay. And this infinity dealership was like, here's the next best thing. We're going to have a passenger EV in 2021. What we have is not optimal, but in the meantime, here's a Tesla. Wow. I don't even understand this at all. So an infinity dealership, has a loyal customer in the town mayor, mm -hmm. and the town mayor now doesn't want Infinities anymore. He wants an EV, and Infinity doesn't want one, but they want to keep him as a customer. So they say, let's just get you, we'll lease you a Tesla or something like that, and then you drive that until ours comes out. That makes sense to me. It kind of, yeah. That's to keep him as a customer, simple. they're going to... I mean, I remember how many times... Remember when you turn in your Audi lease six months or a year early, and then Audi, BMW buys it out, and then, I mean... Somehow that money gets, you know what I mean? The, There's always workarounds for everything, and it all comes from somewhere. But sure. this Infinity dealer. That sounds like a, a hell of a customer service, let alone just, you know, maybe it's because it's the mayor. I don't it's know. a great PR stunt, It's but it's actually like for this guy. They, they love this mayor guy so, so much funny. that they're like, we want to make sure you're taken care of. And we want, it, whether that's us or another product, here's the best that we can offer you until we have the best product that we think is available. Is he paying for it? I can't figure it out. Is it kickback? You know what I mean? Like, is he? <laughs> I don't know. I am amazing. focusing on the positive, and that awesome. does not include the financial sharing. Fair enough. Of things. I'm going too deep. Um, lastly, speaking of sharing the wealth, there is a kid in Chicago that was found to be like walking a deer around in the morning, like walking with the deer in the snow and oh, just like hanging out with it before school. And what it, what this kid was doing. That's what it appeared like to all the adults, correct? Yeah. And so a lot of people, of course, stepped in to be like, what do we do with this deer? What a blah, blah. It's come to find out that this deer is actually blind. And this kid was like, I just want this deer to be okay. It was like pointing out food sources to this deer. As I, what I saw, he would lead the deer over to like the grassy patch of, of it was in the road sometimes or just in the, in the town, in the street, not being able to really figure its way out so this little kid was like come on buddy like this way yeah and wanted and then one, of course the deer would follow him uh, according to the story i read yeah so and uh, that's what i read too and like it warmed, the, heart, it warmed little, little my kid heart wanting to do good and this kid just wanting no kickback like nowhere like just like someone take care of this instagram or no he was like someone take care of this deer it needs to be taken care of how old was the kid do you remember 10 years old i believe I'm like not, i'm so, not worried about the children not, not worried, worried about the kids. Not worried. And that's been what's going on, <laughs> Mrs. Ryan. Da 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 dun dun da da dun dun da 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 dun. <laughs> oh God, that's great. Diane, this is what we do. <laughs> Hope you enjoyed it. Mrs. Ryan, let's take a quick break. We'll get Diane in here. Uh, more to come in a few minutes, ladies and gentlemen. Diane Caffred is going to be in here to talk about Porsche and all the things. You look lovely. The whole outfit, the whole thing. <laughs> uh, we're going to be more to come right after this. We'll be back. Late night play set. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Let's bring it on back. And we are sitting here with Diane Caffaretta. How are you? Good, thank you. It's so nice to see you again. It's been a, a while, I think, a little bit. Yes, I think it was a Cars and Coffee a couple months ago. Yeah, and before that, it but felt like it had been a long time. Mm -hmm. And then we just saw Tony recently, so we were talking about you, of course, and you're here. And we're so excited. So how the heck are you? Great. What is new in your life since, I mean, let's see, we figured out it was about five years ago that we met. I'm pointing at you because mm -hmm. you used oh, to be okay. sitting there. Which I totally forgot about. Really? That it was that long for sure I forgot. I think, I think it should... wasn't quite that long. But any, at any rate, it's Probably been several was. years. I would love to start with yes. who you are and how people can um, how people could relate to you in the Porsche world. Why, why are you here today? How's that? Other than being our friend. Uh, yeah, you race a lot. Got lucky. You, you've got a bunch um, of Porsches. <laughs> yes, I have been obsessed with Porsches since I was a tiny girl. Uh, my dad had a, a Porsche, a 911, and uh, it's really my earliest visual memory of it sitting in the driveway and the smell of it really? and the upholstery. And how I old just, is this earliest memory? I would have been about three. Holy because the house that we were smokes. in, I can, you know, I remember the peonies along the side. I, you know, certain things, um, and. 
I always looked at that as sort of the measure of success that I would hopefully someday have a Porsche. And so as a little girl, I was all about grand, you know, I'm I was daddy's girl, so, uh, you know, I liked anything that he liked, and he liked cars, so <laughs> here I am. That's amazing. So three years old, you fell in love with Porsche, not even really knowing what the hell it was. Right, but of course, it's associated with the fun of it, you know, the driving it, and the sound that it makes, and, and all those things. I mean, objectively, right, it's fabulous. But did you so. get all of that at three years old? I think I learned to appreciate it, but the feeling, it was in the, the, it was feeling in the DNA is, that early. It's just totally different than getting in a Buick, you know, yeah. which... I love all cars, so I actually, you know, but it's a different thing. Yeah. So. Wow, that's amazing. So that early on, uh, did your dad have that Porsche throughout your life or did he have other Porsches throughout? No, he actually switched to a Cutlass uh, because it, the doors wouldn't freeze shut in the winter, which was that's a wise much choice. That's more like a Buick. Yes. We grew up in, you know, I grew up in Chicago. And uh, then he. I don't know he, if I knew that about you. Yes. And then he had a 356 for a short time. Which he sold. In Chicago? Uh, in Chicago. I mean, that's not oh. the best car to drive, I guess, in Chicago, right? Well, in the, the summer. Okay. In the summer it would be, but yeah, most of the time, not so much. Yeah. And All three months of summer <laughs> in the Midwest. <laughs> yes. Well, it's not just an old classic car. I mean, it's an old, it's a six volt. It's an old, there's a lot of uh, headache to go with it. Right, a lot right. Of effort. Yes. And uh, then fast forward to 2004, I got my first Porsche. And, so that uh, gap. That gap, yeah. you just loved Porsche, but you were working on yourself and your career was, and everything else. Yeah, I was getting a bunch of graduate degrees and <laughs> figuring out what I was going to do with my life. And yeah, car was not really interesting. I had a Suzuki Samurai. I had. Did you really? Yes, I had a Camaro. I had a 1969 <laughs> Delta 88, all of which oh, I wow. loved, totally loved. These uh, are all so, over the spectrum, too. All These over are all the different spectrum. types. I, I truly love cars. I what love, does the Delta look like? I have no idea. It's 18 feet long, and it will fit eight <laughs> sorority girls. And in college, I had this thing. It had a huge engine, and uh, it was just super fun. Where did you go to oh college? Oh, my gosh. Indiana. Oh, okay. Fr- yeah. So from Chicago I, to Indiana? Mm-hmm. So it's kind of the same neck of the woods, at least. Not Is too far, yeah. Still Midwest? Did they count that the Midwest? Oh, very much, yes. <laughs> very Midwest. Are you a Midwestern girl? <laughs> yes. Yes. When did you move out to Los Angeles then? 90, uh, 2001. I moved out to California in uh, 93. Oh, 93. okay. So that would have been a better that. question then. When did you move to California? 93. And then was that f- at school or? Right. So I went to, I had to think about the years. <laughs> well, I, it's been a you long said time. you got a bunch of but degrees, yeah. so I'm thinking it's more than just Indiana. Yeah. So I went to Indiana. Then I went to GW, George Washington University, and I got a master's degree in Russian and East European studies. Probably don't know that. And then I switched and I went to Stanford. I went to Moscow for, whoops, sorry. That's okay. uh, Moscow for a while in there. I studied at the Pekhanov Institute because I was a Sovietologist before I was a lawyer. <laughs> you guys are looking really good. No, <laughs> I'm fascinated by uh, I've always so, known I you were incredibly smart. Up. I've always, just talking yep. to you for five minutes, I know you're very, very smart. Well, now, hearing this, the, the, the background of, of what got you to the person that we talked to uh, when we see you is, is kind of fascinating to me. I'm sorry it took this long. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. So, 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 a Sovietologist? Yes. Someone who so studies the back Soviet Back in the day, ways? we studied, yeah, Soviet ways, exactly. So, we studied the Kremlin and who was you know, up on top of the Kremlin during the parades and what order they were in. It would show who Whoa. had power and, you know, all that kind of analysis the, back the, in the, the Cold red, War the red, days. red days, yeah. Yeah. And uh, so I, uh, I thought I was interested? going to be... Were you just interested in that? Or I was very it because of the political climate at the time? I was very interested because I was a linguist. So I, had, I studied Russian and I loved Russian and I'm quarter Ukrainian. So I had interest in that area. And once you start studying, you realize how fascinating it is. And just like, really? They really? That's how it works over there? And so... How many languages do you speak? We're jumping all around, but how many... I feel uh, like it's more than just English and Russian. Well, English right now. I'm pretty, I'm pretty uh, rusty on all the others because I don't use them very much, but I studied a lot of French and German and Russian. And, um, you know, at the time I was pretty good. That's French, German, Russian, England. That's four. Well, yeah. I mean, they're in there somewhere. I know that if I went there and I spent a lot of time, it would come back, but Mm -hmm. it's been a long time. I'm really pretty rusty. I'm getting more and more fascinated with you. I'm thinking that you should buy a boat and sell Dos Equis. (laughs) (laughs) The most interesting woman in the world. Uh, oh, okay, so so I, I didn't mean to get hung up on the, the, the Sovietologist part, but it's that okay. was fascinating It's, it's not me. the sort of thing that comes up all the time? No, and I've never met one. 
<laughs> so well, now I'm excited have. to know one. Yeah, yeah, okay, so after that, stuff. after um, spending some time in Moscow. And then, uh, yeah, so I... We're I, getting uh, back to California from Chicago, Indiana, Russia. Russia. Via, yeah, via <laughs> Washington, D.C. Uh, so I got my MA, oh, went, to, well, went right. to the Plekhanov Institute. I was one of the first Americans to attend that institute, one of ten. And um, so that was amazing. That's I was there tiny. for four months, and it Where was still very that? communist. It's in Moscow. It's in Mo- okay. And, and it was still communist at the time. It was, yeah. Gorbachev was in power, and Glasnost was just starting to happen. So it was a really interesting time. People were talking about things that they hadn't talked about before. And so hadn't I re- been allowed to, probably, right? Hadn't Is been allowed to, and yeah. sometimes very uncomfortably talked to us about those things because we were heavily surveilled. Wow. So uh, when I got back, I thought, oh, and then... Uh, Silence of the Lambs came out, and I was like, I am Clarice, right? <laughs> Me too. <laughs> and so I thought, you know, there are only so many things the Sovietologists could do. And so, you know, uh, I thought, Starling over yeah, there. so I thought, I will be an agent, a counter-espionage agent. And so I applied, and I went through the whole process, and every time I went over there, you know, they'd pat me on the back, and I had the Russian test, and intelligence test, all these things, and, you like know, can't wait to get you, you on board. Yeah. And the NSA had tried to recruit me, and then there was a hiring freeze. Oh, and geez. I was just distraught. Now, You know, sometimes these things happen and you look back later and you're like, (laughs) thank goodness. And this is truly one of those things. Like, I've had a wonderful life and it's it's great. But at the time, I thought, (gasps) what will I do? And uh, my husband at the time said... Uh, you really should be a lawyer. He thought I would make a good lawyer. And so at that point, we moved all to California. All say that, don't they? <laughs> yeah. I actually said, I'm like, you say that to all the girls. And I was like, no weird pickup line, you, you know? Be a lawyer. Yeah, he said it when we met. Yeah. Um, long story around that. But anyway, um, yeah, so I went back to school. I went to Stanford. And so we moved out to California. And I, you know, having been a Sovietologist and not really having, I, I didn't feel I had a sort of solid business background I thought it would be helpful to get an MBA so I got an MBA too oh and uh, yeah Stanford. so no Porsches were in my yeah at Stanford so no Porsches were in my future for a while no because uh, I had to you know yeah get all this big done. hole to dig out of yeah. holy smokes yeah. nuts I did not know <laughs> yes. 90% of that as you were going along with this process obviously the uh, the, the freezing hold the hiring hold uh, uh, hiring freeze sort of that that puts a pause on things but otherwise um, were you just sort of figuring yourself out as you went? Or did you know that, all right, I'm going to get this one, then I'm going to get this one, then I'm going to get this one, then I'm going to get this one, all these degrees? Or were that were you fulfilling yourself? Was it, was it were you, like, what was the reason yes. to really go and... Yes. A human I, doesn't have to do all of that. You chose to. Uh, that's a great question. I think there are a couple of things. Uh, I always followed things I was passionate about. Before Russia, it was singing. After Russia, it was law. You know, I mean, there were things that I was, you know, and I focused on that, and I didn't really worry about money. I just worried about doing it and having a good time and enjoying it. And so that has served me well. And that that was, yeah. Um, So there was certainly that element of it. And um, during that time, do you just know that the rest will come? As long as I focus on this stuff, I didn't steer a lot. Yeah, Yeah, I didn't steer a lot. And, uh, and things just happened, and I had wonderful opportunities, and I made my own luck in some cases. You know, my dad taught me that, and so I would, you know, embrace things. And I'm I'm pretty resilient sort, so, you know, if you put me in a big bucket of hardship, I can pretty much crawl my way out and wind up on top. And it may take a while, but... Um, but your attitude is that way. Your natural yeah, attitude seems can, to be that way. I can handle pretty much whatever I need to. So, yeah. So it just kind of developed, and I, I wound up getting... Uh, a fabulous job. I, I'm, I've been a partner at Quinn Emanuel, which I don't know. Are you familiar with Quinn at all? Well, only through you. Okay. And so, your LinkedIn. yeah. So, Quinn is the world's largest all business litigation firm. And when I was getting my MBA at Stanford, I thought, what an amazing business model. You know, most law firms were kind of antiquated and they had antiquated structures and communication wasn't so good between the top and the bottom of the hierarchy. And, you know, law is very hierarchical. And I was looking at Silicon Valley developing and thinking, well, that's fabulous. That's a totally <laughs> different thing, you know. Wide open. And uh, and Quinn represented kind of the newest, uh, most amazing model where people would try cases and be the best at trying cases and, you know, and, uh, and wear casual clothes while doing it and, uh, have this sort of crucible of creativity and talent and hire the best of the best from all the schools. And, and it's been amazing. I've been there for more than 20 years. So 
that that's all right. incredible. <laughs> and you, yeah, you painted a beautiful picture. Was that always Quinn's intent to 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 fill the pool with uh, with art and creativity and stuff like that? Because I don't always think of those things when I think of law, having grown yeah. up around law as well. Well, I think it was to have the very best litigation practice in the world, mm. to be able to try cases. I mean, we have a 90% oh, win rate. Oh, outside the box, of Yeah, course. so you've got to have, you know, and, and from my MBA side, you know, I, I, I thought it was really important to have communication. You can have a jury room, room filled with different people and only two of them will speak most of the time, you know. So you have to find a way of getting people to have an environment where they feel comfortable and the ideas will come out. And that's what we do all the time at Quinn. We, th- we come up with amazing solutions to problems. It makes you feel all powerful. So it's super fun. Uh, but it's but you can't do that if you have some first year in the corner like, oh, I'm not sure what I'm doing. You know, you have to engage people. And that's something we do really well. So I think of it in terms of creativity. I'm not sure that, you know, John Quinn would necessarily focus on that as the main thing. But I, I think that's where a lot of the magic happens, actually. Wow. I really think you're fascinating. Oh, well, thank you. Uh, something that came <laughs> yeah. to my mind while you were discussing that and some of the things you said, perhaps is maybe the easiest thing that I've overlooked. It's almost you're just a communicator. You're a communicator. You can you can translate. You can just you're a communicator. Hmm. Is that is that true? Is that would you how would you fancy yourself? As, as a person, I say I'm a communicator for the sake, not just because I'm a talk show host, but I can take one thing and make somebody else understand it for the most part. It seems like your job is that. You have to take whatever we believe or whatever our side, our position is, and then make everybody else believe it or at least see our side. I agree. I never thought about it. I never thought but... about it. I don't know what I'm saying right now, but yeah. I never noticed that. <laughs> yeah. it's, you're performing one way or the other. Yes, and and you do have to, I mean, communication is about really having somebody hear you and understand you and vice versa, right? So I need to be able to explain, you know, a technology often to a jury. So I need to understand it well enough so that I can explain it to somebody else. And um, and uh, that's something, that's really a joyful thing, right? To be able to share something like that with people and have them But the ability to be able to break something down and then to its simplest form and then rebuild it for someone so that they can understand it in a different way is is a a, a skill. And and that's something that a lot of people can't do at all. That's true. Tony can do it. Tony probably can. Well, again, though, that's very uh, Mm -hmm. transferable to what he does for a living. Right. We have that in common. Hmm. Yeah. So, yes, I do. I do a lot of communication and I'm also kind of a fighter. You know, I I really love litigation. I love the game of it. And I love doing so it. So you enjoy the process as well? Oh, very much. It's it's uh, intriguing to try to outwit people. I have uh, very often in my cases, I have very challenging cases. You know, we get the cases where people are like, oh, I tried this other lawyer. It didn't work <laughs> out. I need the best of the best. Um, We've and gotten so, to this point, basically. Yeah, or big cases like Samsung or Lehman Brothers. You know, I've done all these cases that where you had serious billions of do- dollars at stake. And so you get really bad conduct on the other side sometimes or just – a lot of money behind the positions that are taken. And so you really have to be clever in order to figure out how to expose what's going on and how to reveal the truth. And so uh, that is really motivating, you know, when, um, and it can be on kind of any level. It could be on what they're hiding in discovery, right? It still uh, kind of revs me up, you know. I I was that kid in the play yard that was like, you know, you can't do that to him. You know, I mean, that was, yes. that's totally me. So. Well, that may be kind of what yes. I'm talking about then. And I just don't know how to, I don't know how to communicate it. It's <laughs> almost like you can see through the bullshit, find the nugget, and then pull that out and extrapolate and then only look at this nugget. Very good. Yes, exactly. Yes. So I'm often exposing the hanky panky. And so it's, it's pulling out. Sometimes it's just the common sense. And, you know, sometimes I get clients that are, they're not quite seeing like, well, we could just say this. And I say, no, but you want to say this because it shows how unreasonable they were when they did this and they didn't think that we were going to catch them. But that really exposes that this was actually intentional. Right. You know, and now I need to pull that out and Position. give me two more examples of that. And now I've got a very different looking case, right? So I God. find that you're really good at translating the emotion behind things with the intellectual intelligence and framework that mm. exists. And that to me speaks really loudly about how Porsche de- re- de- reinvents itself by doing the same thing better. Mm. It, it, Evolution, you mean? Yeah, it's, it's all refinement of like, you every time we talk you have a different kind of client and that's one of the things i love like you're not closed off to anything i don't think and that's only helped you translate it's given you more breath from which to translate Mm -hmm. i think i'm saying no that's right that's right yeah i have a a range i've 
I've represented but, Lehman Brothers, and I've represented it's funny, a been wonderful one, cannabis company. I mean, I've got them all. <laughs> you've been so. at one place for 20 years, but I don't imagine that any, I mean, every case is completely different. I don't imagine anything is uh, gets boring. It never gets boring. That's true. That's true. <laughs> how, what are your, how, I don't want to spend too much time on your work, but I am fascinated, and I think Mrs. Ryan is too. Uh, the, the casual work uh, attire thing was uh, uh, sort of a, a, <laughs> a shocker to me. I'm picturing long hours. I'm pictur- I worked on a lot of David E. Kelly law dramas. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I worked on The Practice yep. and Boston Legal and stuff like that. Uh, and, and my mom was a paralegal at it, whatever. So I grew up around the, the, the whole thing. I'm going to call it the system. I'm picturing when we had somebody on, on The Practice, we would have a – call it a, a cigarette company or something like that. And then they would go to the, – our little firm from the show was too small to handle it. They'd have to go to this big high-rise firm over here and get with them, and then they'd have to – are you in the big high-rise firm? Is that what's going on? Are you the yes. specialist firm of like, no, we only deal with the Lehman Brothers, the the, the big cases like uh, that? It's not all big cases. I mean, I've oh. represented a four-person company against the wireless industry. I represent, but it's a, it's yeah, a, I do all kinds of stuff. I have, but against the wireless industry is pretty big. That was big. Yeah, big. Um, I have a cannabis company right now that is relatively small, but they have some valuable trademarks, and they're against another cannabis company. Um, oh, that makes sense. Just, I mean, it really, it, it's about the challenge. It's not all the mega cases, thank, thank goodness. Not, not that they're not wonderful. They have their own level of wonderful, but we get a really good mix. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and now actually, uh, well, one of the things that I've been working on, why I was just in New York last week, is I have a, a class action on behalf of models. So models are, it's not all the glamour that you would think that it is. Model, where the like agencies models, take like advantage. Models. Yeah, wow. models. And uh, so we have a class action, uh, and we're on the plaintiff side, and we are uh, making sure that they get paid for their, you know, for usages, for, you know, under New York labor law, they're we don't believe that they have. Um, and then also, I've just recently become the co-chair of our new practice area, which is really exciting. Congratulations. It's, within your thank company? You. Yes, within within our firm. It's the Sexual Harassment and Employment Discrimination Group, and it is a oh. plaintiff side, victim side, uh, Me Too practice, essentially. So, Well, this is um, very good. This is, this is very, very neat. timely right now. It's very timely, yes. Very needed. Okay. So can we talk about what that's going to be? Because maybe you're going to change the whole... If you're figuring out how to do this, maybe you're going to so – everyone will copy you and this will be the new way. It's going to change things up, I think. You know, um, I mean, there are many fine practitioners out there, right, doing this kind of work on the plaintiff side. But they can easily be outgunned by a company that has great resources, resources. and a lot of money and a lot of motivation to squelch it. And so we believe we're in a good position to – change that dynamic and and so we're helping some women on a pro bono basis we're doing some contingency cases um oh, and uh it, and it's very wide ranging we're you know we did this sort of study to see well what industries should we target <laughs> that's <laughs> what i was gonna ask them. you weird <laughs> yes yes Jeez. wherever there's a bad actor you know <laughs> and uh and they're often you know repeat perpetrators so uh you know you find one you find the others um it's it's been really interesting and we're just i think it's just the tip of the iceberg Iceberg. And a you, lot it of it is. is about companies that, you know, they're not really addressing it. They're kind of trying to deal with it, trying to manage the problem when it comes up, but they're not necessarily carrying through and making sure that the, you know, the line employees, the managers, everybody is on board with, you know, what needs to be done when somebody has this kind of experience. Moment, yeah. And so. Do you watch television at all? Are you a TV person? Not really a TV don't, person. I don't imagine you have time for it. More like a movie person. There's a new show of, on Apple TV, you know, the oh, Apple yeah? Plus, okay. called The Morning Show, and it's Jennifer Aniston and Reese Witherspoon, Reese Witherspoon. and uh, Steve oh, Carell. Okay. It's a bunch of people, but it's basically a morning show, like a Good Morning America or a, or a Today show, where uh, one of the anchors it has to oh. step down because of uh, conduct and stuff, and then they're, they're exploring it on all sides. Oh, sounds interesting. And it's interesting. uncomfortable really uncomfortable sometimes and it's educational sometimes and um and entertaining sometimes it's just it's a very interesting thing to put all of us right in the room um and i would imagine that you have to deal with that or you will be having to deal with that sort of stuff all the time Mm -hmm. if you were a tv person i was gonna say oh you should check out morning show but well maybe not no i will i mean i can always venture there (laughs) it's 10 hours though you don't have 10 hours (laughs) (laughs) i'm gonna go back to the blue card yes Um, (laughs) <laughs> what what was your childhood like? You told us a little bit about it and how you found the cars and everything. Were oh, you yeah. were you this type of go getter? Were you this type of uh, uh sort of? Yeah. I uh, my mom taught me how to read when I was three, 
and uh, That's she was early, a, right? Three. Yeah, she was a teacher and uh, a, a wonderful. I had terrific parents, um, which which is I think. Yeah, I mean, that's why I'm here. I've got little pieces of all of them. Uh, And uh, so, so yeah, so I, they, my folks split up though when I was five and I lived with my dad and, uh, but I saw my mom on the weekends and her new husband, who's my stepdad. And uh, then my dad remarried when I was 10. And um, yeah, I grew up in Evanston, Illinois which is a wonderful place to grow up. And then my other family lived in Villa Park, so we saw them every other weekend. And But, I mean, you. I mean, you yeah. in school and stuff, you were always you were getting the good grades and doing yeah. the AP classes and all that stuff. That seems like yeah, the person who Yeah, but not, you not necessarily all of them, you know? Like, I, I did uh, an advanced chemistry and physics and dropped out. I mean, I was just like, I can't do that. This is not me. I can't do it or I no was, interest? Uh, kind of when we got to moles, I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> I think I was way too young to do that because I had skipped a grade, so I was oh, younger, and I really don't think that undeveloped. the accelerated class, I think it was just too much, and both of them together, I was just like, uh, that's, that's a lot. Yeah. Mm. I like biology, but the sophomore year, it was supposed to be sophomore, junior, senior, uh, chem, phys, and yeah, what, I wiped uh, out after soft, uh, first. Oh, that's a, probably a good one. Yeah, because I could read. So I'm just like sitting there and everybody's uh, But you're not going to admit, you won't, yeah. fit, you're going to make those friends and then you'll be in this, it's not like seventh or eighth where, well, oh, so-and-so is skipping ahead. Now they're yeah, older. Yeah, no, no, everybody's pretty you oblivious. Oh, yeah. at that point. Gosh, you were advanced at that age. I've never heard of somebody skipping first grade. <laughs> well, I, I asked, you know, if something could be done. I was bored and. Come on, you facilitated it? Yeah, and you know, my dad was supportive, but you know, the teacher was against it, as I recall, but the principal was like, she can do this. So luckily it was just none. And she was just like, I I think this would be fine, you know? And so she pushed it through and it was great because I could read and I yeah. was, you know, it worked out fine. You probably were much more stimulated with uh, slightly older children. Yeah. Or at least a slightly older Until curriculum. Until Kemp is, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what AP did you like? Um, well, I love math. Okay. Does that come into play for you nowadays? No, yeah. not so much. But I love math. Still? I'm really, yeah. It's probably my best subject. Really? Really. I, language, I would assume. I would just assume. <laughs> yeah. No, I think even more. Um, I mean, math. I could, I could skip the entire class and then learn it in a weekend and go in and get an A in the you test. You got the language. Just good it at, made sense. Definitely. Yeah. I can, yeah. But language, you'd ha- you know, you can't do that. So, yeah, I think universal, math is, Universal is, language is mathematics. I mean, that may translate to how smart you are. Maybe you're an alien from, you know, who knows how many. <laughs> I don't know where it comes from. I think my parents would be like, I don't know either. Um, but yeah, so, so yeah, in terms of where I came from and sort of my pieces, I think I would say, you know, my mom and dad, so my stepmom and my dad were both advertising executives. And my mother wound up the CEO of Young and Rubicam Chicago. And I think that's kind of important in my development because I saw her working her way up from secretary to becoming the CEO of a company. Strong and woman. yeah. And um, and my dad was a creative, so uh, very what? neat dynamic, you know, very creative kind of background. What did your dad and, do um, in the advertising in a creative way? Uh, okay. You know, the Corona ads with the palm trees and the one the lights beach? up? Sure. That's his ad. No kidding. Yes. Everybody knows that. Yeah, ad. of course. It's been, like 30 years wow. yeah a lot of corona um also the helping hand for helping uh, but what did hamburger he helper. Do, what did he do was he the creative director behind these or yes. was he a, oh my goodness gracious yes yeah, so the helping hand Truly for his yeah campaigns. for hamburger help that's his the little guy character yeah and a good part of mcdonald land was created by him mcdonald land the playground yeah like the evil gr- well be way before the playground yeah this right? was the evil the grimace yeah. it used to be the even now it's just the grimace right but it was the evil grimace when he came up with there it and there mccheese yes yeah. right yeah oh and my all god well we at the play spaces they would have all of the yeah. things based on the characters right when, okay. at, when when i was a kid <laughs> right right when i was a boy <laughs> Holy and then my smokes. other family, my my mother, my real mother, was a stay at home mom. She was involved in a lot of genealogical groups. She was absolutely brilliant and uh, could do anything with her hands. She sh- sewed, she cooked, she made pickles. She, I mean, she was just interested in everything. She could tell you the intricacies of the Battle of Midway. She Whoa. could talk about paleontology. She could talk about Indian, uh, what plants the Indians used and why. 
Um, and my stepdad also was into a lot of that stuff. He's an engineer, amazing person. And so I had this just phenomenal group of adults, which even though my family kind of you know, erupted and fell apart at five, I then watched these two wonderful relationships as I oh grew up and, and uh, this very vibrant set of people uh, that uh, could sort of tackle anything. And so uh, that, that's kind of where I really came from. And then I also have a wonderful aunt who, who came in the middle of all this and, you know, was trying to make sure, you know, there was somebody at home uh, in between, you know, because my, before my stepmom came into the picture, she was around and she's an artist. And so just another amazing person. So I really got lucky. I can't on, believe uh, how much art and creativity you were people. around. And then you are a, 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 an attorney. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> It's amazing to me. Yeah, yeah. well, it's, it's creative enterprise. Can't be too creative, but the way you, you do know, it you've got to think out of the box or you're just, yeah. you know, you're just wasting money. <laughs> uh, can we get to cars? Yeah. Can we talk about Love Porsche cars. a little bit? Yeah. You've got a handful of Porsches, most I do. of which I think we've seen. Can we go down the list? Uh, sure. I have, uh, yeah, I some of them I've now sold. So oh, okay. I, it might be it's a shorter list than it used to be. <laughs> Could be. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, that's all right. Well, uh, how about what was your first one? You mentioned it before. Oh yeah, I had a uh, C4S, a 2004 C4S. It's my first one. They've all been a stick except for my GT3. Uh, but uh, yeah, I love driving a manual. Mm-hmm. Uh, that was for my stepdaddy, Tommy. Um, now, when you got your C4S, you're just driving on the street. You're not doing track driving or any of that nope. stuff yet. You're just oh, I finally am fulfilling the dream of getting the Porsche. Yep, didn't even occur to me that people did that. So had no how idea. did you start doing that? How, what, uh, how did that come to be? You know, I just... Uh, I know you more as a track person yeah. than, than anything else. Right. Um, no, it took me a long time to get there. I went to Porsche Driving School with my dad, father-daughter weekend. We had a great time right around 2004, 2005 uh, in wow. Alabama and just loved it and thought of it as a an amusement park, more or less. Like mm. you go, you sit in the car, and then you get back and you don't ha- incorporate that into your life because people don't really do that. And <laughs> you so... You can't drive like Dukes of Hazard on the road. Unfortunately not. And so I just kind of put it down. And I was also a super workaholic for many, many years. I just really... Now that sounds right. Yeah. I'm a very intense sort and I can sit for long periods of time and do even really tedious things and be perfectly happy. And (laughs) yeah. And I had a not so great relationship for a couple decades. So I think staying at work was a a good good move. And yeah, maybe... I did didn't that. help me figure that out fast enough, but right. that's okay. That's life. And so, and I was doing all these crazy cases, right? I was doing, <laughs> yeah, Samsung, Mattel, you know, amazing clients. And um, so, yeah, so I was doing that. And then at 42, I had breast cancer. I was oh. diagnosed with uh, breast cancer, and it was a super fast growing. One of the breast cancer specialists that I went to said it was the fastest one he'd ever seen in 30 years. And I was like, Congratulations. Well, yeah, no, I know. It no was like, surprise I'm an overachiever. Oh, overachiever. Such an achiever. <laughs> uh, but I, you know, I was in the middle of trial in the Mattel case, and I was sitting with all my experts, and we were talking. This won't and, work. Yeah, and I was like, <laughs> I need to leave now. I got the diagnosis, and I needed surgery right away. And so they pulled it out, and I went through chemo and radiation. And what began was a, a where am I in this world? You yes. know, I had sort of assumed that I was invincible, and pretty much am, you know. Uh, But that was a real attention getter. And I think it was meant by the universe to be a bit of an attention getter. We couldn't do that on a small scale and have me actually listen. No. And so... I'd knock you on your ass. Yeah. So for about five years after that, I learned how to manage and, you know, create some balance and create some hobbies. And one of the things that came out of that was the cars. I went back to, you know, what do I really like to do? If I had to check out in two years, what would I have wanted to do? And it would be drive my car on the track. You know, there's so reason, there's yeah. a reason we connect. Having never known that story, there's obviously a reason that we connected, and and you know that was the same yeah. thing that happened mm-hmm. to us when we met you. Our life just totally went in the toilet. Yeah. Thanks a lot. <laughs> yeah, but you have to take these lessons, right? They're exactly. lessons, and what do I do with this? You know, right. and so and uh, yeah, and, and sometimes be, you be can't see it for a while. Be yeah. willing to change. Be willing to throw it all out. So back right. to you, though. Yes. Back to you. No, yes. no, no. I oh. keep going. Oh, back to me. Okay. So I had the C4S, <laughs> and I loved it. And then I got a turbo. Uh, it was uh, Arctic Silver, okay. and it was a was 2008. It, just an upgrade? Just uh, it was an upgrade, yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, it was a great car. But then <laughs> I wanted phone connectivity. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so I had to buy a whole new car. That worked, didn't it? <laughs> yeah. So I 
And basically, they say I had a 997 Generation 1 Turbo, and I got a 997 2 Turbo so that I could actually speak on the phone through the car because Porsche, as we all know, isn't real big on those niceties. And so that's what I drive today. It is my forever car. I call it forever because I will drive it as long as I can push yeah. in the clutch. And it's black on black, and it's beautiful and voluptuous, and uh, it's sex on wheels. I mean, it's just... I, love I that think that's you've your seen daily. it. Yeah. Oh, many times. And yeah, it's my I daily driver. Yeah, daily. it makes me feel super powerful. It's like I want to be over there and I'm there, you know. And, and how about uh, when you get out of yeah. it? I mean, you know, you get you get surprise looks, you get uh huh, that's right looks. I mean, there's all that uh, stuff. And even when though you're doing clean, it for you. When it's clean, I get people because it's they really beautiful. It, right? yeah. yeah. If it's dirty, people just don't, they don't even know what it is. They're like, oh, it's one of those Porsches. <laughs> you know, they're all over LA. But yeah, I notice it when it's clean. I get the, oh, you know. But Talk about looks. When I come into the parking lot every night and I see that, I still I still get excited. You do still. Yeah. We do the same thing. Yeah. It's just, I mean, how lucky am I to have this? It's something about, so, you know, always turn around, always turn back and look or whatever. Like yeah. it's, a, a, you know, your lover or mm-hmm. whatever. <laughs> <laughs> just passing. <laughs> Uh, okay, well, that's that's one turbo, but you had yeah. the GT3. Do you still have a GT3? So I had, uh, yeah, so two, yeah, two, two turbos, and then I got the GT3 uh, for track because I thought that was a good idea, and I didn't really have a but lot of good advice. You, so you had the turbo, and you started doing track days, and you decided to get a track I car? St- yes, I started with the black turbo, mm-hmm. and uh, I actually started with autocross. Oh, sure. Uh, and I wasn't quite sure how to get on the track yet uh, because it seemed like there were a lot of requirements. I wasn't sure that my car was... You know, like I had all of them. It seemed like it at first. Yeah, yeah. and my husband was insistent that I have insurance um, and all these sort of requirements. So I had to go with the flow at the time. Um, And he was generally not really in favor. He didn't understand why anybody would want to go in circles fast. And I'm like, okay, well, we just don't understand each other on this, you know. But he did encourage me to get the GT3 um, for whatever reason. And... um, So I had that. It was beautiful. It was white. uh, And it was uh, 2015. So it was after the fires. And uh, it was a fabulous car. It, again, made me completely uh, powerful. And uh, I had a great time with it at Festival of Speed. Did you switch out cars or did you have multiple Porsches? I, I switched them out until the GT3. And then I had the GT3 and the Turbo. And I retired the turbo from track stuff because I didn't want to ruin it. That That's truly right. is the forever car. Got to have that, you know, in 20 So you still have years. that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, okay. Yeah. That's oh, I was going to say it's here. parked up front, but it's not. It's actually, I borrowed one. <laughs> but, the, um, but the white one is not, you don't have the white. So GT3 I sold anymore. the, I will, yeah, I sold the GT3. It lost its engine at 16,000 miles. Oh. And they replaced the engine. They gave me a new one. And at the time, I had a couple of different things going on. I was going through a a difficult divorce litigation and so cash was a good thing sure. and I thought this is a really good time to sell it because it was a brand new engine it's like giving somebody a brand new car yeah, yeah. and uh and then also I uh, met Tony um well I knew him when I started with the track stuff but uh but just as friends you know and he when I was buying the GT3 he said you know you really need to buy something slow you know you should be in a Honda or Miata or something I was like what <laughs> and um and so to, but i was in the process to of my, to really learn how to drive yeah, yeah. and you know as you know that's really Miata's important great, that's why all these call, yeah. and why these pro drivers all start with go-karts is you have to feel the car and you have to understand what's going you have to understand the physics and, and all that so uh but i was in the middle of buying the gt3 and i you know i was smitten of course who wouldn't be yeah. and so oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah especially then when it was new i mean holy cow <laughs> it, was, it was hot 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 and uh so, yeah, so I so I wound up selling it to a girlfriend who also tracks her car, so I see it all the time. Oh, and lovely. It's still yeah, in the family. Yeah, it's still in the family, and she's another petite woman, So, and her that's husband had a awesome. GT3, so she knew what she was getting into. Oh, that's amazing. Same year and everything, so we see them all the time, and that's really cool. And then I got a Boxster, so I have a- Oh, that's a, a great race car. It's a fantastic car, and it took me a long time to appreciate it because it's mid-engine, which is like a I'm fish w- out of water. I'm with you. <laughs> Felt totally different. Um, but once you get to- pedal down and spin that thing around and they rotate pretty it's well. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. yeah, it's a lot of fun. And now we're one. The last couple times I've been, and this is now like three years. It took me a long time because I have to all of this. It. Yeah, I have all this, you know, seat time. I mean, every day since 2004, that's what I've been driving as a 911. So I could feel the Rear pendulum. End. Yeah, and you don't have that at all. It's totally different. We were just talking about that yeah. the other day. Yeah, so, uh, and it's a 2.5. So it's every bit as slow as... 
my others are fast. Yeah, but that's so, what you want. Yeah, and, and it is. On it. It's a momentum It is, and car. then I catch up with the faster cars, and it's all that much more fun, right? right? Because now I know I'm actually learning, and every time I go out in it, I learn more. Oh, God, isn't that the most so. fun? When you're in a slow, stupid car, and you're catching up on all these people mm-hmm. with so much money behind the wheel and everything mm-hmm. else, it's just... I love it. I love it. Mm-hmm. And I'm, you know, I'm on the gas right away. And, you know, they're, they're just sitting in front of me. And it's like, you're in my way. Yeah, you're just in my get way. out of the way. Get like, out of the way. 2.5. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's, like, oh, it's hilarious. But <laughs> oh, my gosh. Um, do you, so I'm, I'm assuming then, uh, because of the track time, if you could pick between the two, probably Porsche Owners Club is where you would spend more time. Is I that? have been spending more time with the yeah. POC. I love the PCA also. I've, you know, I've done many, many events with both clubs, You've but board, I find yeah. myself doing more of the POC stuff. It's a little bit more flexible in terms of the requirements for the racing. It's less uh, bureaucratic because it's just, you know, a bunch of guys basically. And uh, yeah, <laughs> they, so they I do wind up doing do a lot more of the often, And I find that it, it, people kind of just, oh, we know what we're doing. You don't kind of need the breakdown and the checklist. Every, I mean, right. checklist, yes, but you know, the, the rule list every single Right. Time. You don't need it all spelled out for you There's as much as There's an unspoken the PCA. understanding of this is what we do. Yeah. All that stuff mm-hmm. is really super important yeah. and totally necessary for yeah. liability purposes, obviously. Mm-hmm. But if you've heard it a hundred times, can we get to the track? Right. Right. It's that's kind fair. of a balance, that's but I've been enough. doing it long enough to where I'm comfortable with that, and you know, I I still think that's good for the newbies. And I teach, you know, I instruct, and I was going to get to that. Um, yeah. So you are instructing, yes, currently, yes. Do you instruct in whatever car they're in, or do they come with you in your Boxster? Uh, ideally, both. But PCA oh. has fairly rigid rules about who can be in your car. Oh really? Uh, so, and I'm trying to remember if POC does too. I don't think POC does, but I don't if recall. I have a Hans device and a and a you know. Uh, six point seat belt, which I do. Six, five point, five point seat harness. Belt. Yeah, five point harness. Then the other person next to me also has to have that. And so if they don't have a Hans device, they can't sit in my car. Oh, that's weird. Which I don't quite understand. I was like, could I take off my Hans device? And now we're even. And but they can't do it. So that makes it a little tricky. So often I'm just in their car. Okay. And I will drive their car unless it's something really tricky that I just don't want to. You know, like I had, I was teaching somebody in. Um, one of the doctor killers. I'm forgetting what the number is right now, but um, I was like, and it was it was a woman, and she was new, and I was like, this is a very dangerous car, and we need to be respectful of all the power it has. But I didn't okay. drive that one because I was like, I don't want to be responsible for this. Oh. She did great too. She was really respectful and understanding of the weight, and you know, we talked about these things, and I kind of got her used to the idea. So was that thanks to your instruction that she did great? No, a I lot think of people she was... don't really understand the weight transfer and all that. Well, first. I think it was. You know, it comes down to personality, right? How well do you take instruction? How well do you, oh. you know, what you're, if you're one of those guys that's like, I drive fast all the time. You're not necessarily going to, yeah, there's that guy. So that's a different thing. She was a naturally kind of cautious person. It's her mm-hmm. dad's car. She doesn't want to screw it up. And it is, it was a tricky car to drive. It was tricky to shift in that. I wish I could remember the number. I'm feeling lame that I can't remember. Oh, that's okay. I, um, I it's called the doctor killer though. Slat nose. The doctor killer. Anyway, um, I didn't tell I mean, her that it was note. called that. I didn't <laughs> mention that nickname. But, um, yes, incredibly fast car. But she handled it very well because she had to be thinking about how to shift and stuff. So I think there was, you know, a, it tempered her enthusiasm for sort of sure. going all out, too. But, you know. There's not- a presence that it sounds like comes with that respect that she has for it. So mm-hmm. maybe that helps. Mm-hmm. That's it. You're incredibly present all the time. That's one thing I've always known about you. When you when some people you look them in the eye and they're there, oh. and oh. you're just there. You're present at all times, ready to go. Is that yeah. you? Who you are? Is that your diet? Is that your energy? Is that your workout? Is that your your, your is that just who you are? Uh, maybe it's my Midwestern upbringing. I I, I don't know. It's a I'm, huge compliment, especially in Los Angeles, where a lot of people yeah, it's hard I, to make a connection with. I don't like those people. I don't either. Yeah, I don't really understand people like that. I pick up on that very quickly. and Oh, you know exactly what I'm talking not about. Not a fan. Then. Yeah, mm. not a fan. Okay. I mean, you know. Uh, yeah, like Tony is a great example of someone that is just present and wonderful and oh, yeah. authentic. I'm really yes. big on authenticity. And part of that is that connection that you have with somebody. You I, know, even a stranger at the grocery store when you, you know, joke about something falling off the rack or whatever, that you, you should be able to connect with that person very quickly. And if you don't, there's something concerning. <laughs> you know. 
<laughs> what we're talking about sounds so simple, but it, it's a, a daily struggle if you're out and around people, I find. Some people are I mean, even in traffic or whatever. Or... I mean, pe- yeah, people mm-hmm. are elsewhere doing other things instead of being in the moment. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. It's tough. Yeah. But you don't seem to be that way. Is that anything you've ever struggled with? I don't think so. you've just always been present? I don't think so. A pretty <laughs> serious driver. You know, I'll drive yeah. fast, but I'm all there. Alert. I'm paying attention. You know, yeah. I'm kind of that way. I, I certainly, you know, I get... I don't know, 2,000 emails a day, something ridiculous. Uh, you know, that is the life of a law firm. So a busy law firm like ours, we communicate constantly by email. I have 200 partners, so it's busy, you know. And being able to sift through and figure out what I need to pay attention to becomes a bit of a struggle. But, yeah, That's you just sometimes have skill to, set. You have yeah. to put it aside and just focus. I mean, you That's can't it. function. So your focus and your – it sounds like maybe you have a, a – a <laughs> <laughs> I recall is awful today. Too long of a weekend. Uh, uh, um, uh, whatever. It doesn't matter. Okay. You're amazing and awesome. <laughs> oh, well, uh, thank back you. to the card. Uh, did you? Were you ever into comedy at all? You're so quick and so smart. I was curious if you had ever enjoyed comedy or ever wanted to, to be funny or anything. You're pretty funny anyway, but you're not. No, you're not often trying to be funny. And you're I think just I'm kind of nerdy, funny. actually. But. Thank that's you. what makes you fun. Yeah, I think that's, yeah. <laughs> Me too, and us too. Like, it's the nerdery. It's, yeah, it, yeah. It's, the celebration it's of, like, whatever, whatever. Do you right. enjoy comedy? Right. Are you a fan of comedy? Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, would you ever go to a comedy show? Oh, Do yeah. Do you watch comedy? Movies, oh, definitely. There's like actually, that? I don't know if you've seen it, there's a great, uh, what do you call it? It's like a series, uh, but you can get it in video. I can loan it to you, but it's a a. a a show on comedy and the development of comedy over time with all these different comedians in it is, is it really CNN, good. the history of comedy? Maybe. I don't know. <laughs> Somebody gave it to me as a That's video wonderful. set, you know, so I don't I don't remember. Oh, it it's neat. yellow. The boxes are yellow. Well, I love anyway, that. Anyway, it's really interesting because it talks about the importance of satire and the importance about being able to laugh at yourself and all these things, which, you know, not everybody gets. It's incredibly important. It was unintentional to lead to this, but yeah. you're the perfect person to ask. I find that comedy is... Uh, the, t- the landscape of the world is making comedy less funny because there's not mm-hmm. there's less places you can go. Everyone's very uh, everything's being taken more personally, right? Perhaps for good reason. Mm-hmm. Um, I find that comedy is. I shouldn't say I find. I have a prediction. I have a. I have a. Uh, I think comedy is going to have to go a little bit more underground, and I think that um, the topography is changing because of what we were talking about before and the Me Too movement and everything else. And I don't mean just guys. I mean like, oh, you can't really make a joke anymore. Do you, do you, would that, it's almost like I should have this conversation with you in a year. (laughs) I'm I'm a little ahead of myself. No, I I see that. And I, I have concern about our lack of sense of humor. I think a lot of people like that gene is just missing in them. And, you know, they get upset. Sometimes I hear news stories and someone has their panties in the, in a twist over something that makes zero sense. Mm. And I'm just like, Dude, step back. <laughs> like, that is not something to be mad at. But yet they're mad. So there's something else going on um, that has excuse. caused some people to lose their sense of humor. But I think we need to retain it. And I think we do need to criticize. And I lived in the Soviet Union. So I know what it's like when nobody can criticize anybody. That's it's why a I'm... really dangerous world. And oh. so as an ex-Sovietologist, I just find that incredibly troubling. And I think I think we all need to step... And sometimes people will say, oh, I'm not sure I should say this because you're now this Me Too person. And I'm like, no, that's hilarious, right? Yeah. <laughs> because you, can, you can't lose your common sense. But some people right. have just... I don't know whether they don't have enough in their lives or they're just... They need that drama. I think there's... there's a lot of I know some on. people that are like that, that yeah. feed on drama all the time. And if you're doing that, then you need to get all crazy about something random. And I just... <sighs> I, my life's too busy for that. That's it. Man. So I, I, the I think thing. there are enough brave busy. people out there. Hmm. I think I think we brave souls have to sometimes step back and say, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> That's actually really funny. <laughs> think about it this way. And it's you know, and it's about it's about who are you, right? Are you going to always go with the flu you know, I, sometimes I think of like who would I be in Nazi Germany, right? Would I step up? Would I hide I people in my basement? Would yeah. I say something? We don't know. We haven't walked in those shoes, but I would like to think that in a world where we can't talk about anything and it's feeling more and more Orwellian to me every day, that at least I'm the voice of, hey, rule of law is really good, individual <laughs> rights, freedom of speech, you know, that that I, you know, I try to be a champion for that in my own little way. And so, and part of that is saying, no, that is funny, you know. Right. Standing up for it. Yeah. I'm not going to be somebody who is, uh, you know, oh, can't say that, you know. Right. You're not going to stifle me and run me down. Right. 
Boy, that's a dangerous world. We don't gonna, want to go yeah, there. Yeah, but I think <laughs> this is going to become a much more important topic agree. in the next couple of years. I it's mean, already if it continues yeah, going in this direction. I agree. Yes, I feel like you're seeing early stories of it, and it's becoming more and more commonplace that people just don't understand. I feel like it's because they're not present; they're distracted by the phone and social media and like everything they think they need to pay attention to. Fake mm-hmm. importance to a lot of bullshit stuff that and doesn't it, mm-hmm. garner it. Yeah, and it's people like you that can see past all that, and you too, and me sometimes, like. All that stuff. That's what makes it funny. Like you're being crazy about something that really doesn't matter. That's what's hilarious. And like you just are seeing the early side of the legal side of it because it's become an issue. Yeah, I'm excited that you're on the forefront yeah. of this other thing right now. That you are. That you are at your firm. I'm mm-hmm. curious to see what you do with it. I hope that you um, will keep us abreast even all It's an interesting yeah. perspective to have in that mix. Mm-hmm. I'm really glad. Mm-hmm. How are you doing? Do you feel good about this experience? I do. I'm having a great time. No, I yeah, mean, it's, I, it's, it's, yeah. it's about over. I mean, we've gone pretty long. Oh, oh I was just going to say, um, kind of to your point, that um, one thing I noticed with this trend is that people, we seem to be in this weird pattern where we're all looking at differences all the time. And we have so much in common. All the time. So much more in common, in fact, that it's mystifying to me why that one little thing is the focus and and then we lose sight of all the rest. And so I hope that we start to, I, I do see people starting to react because it, once it gets so crazy, and this is something we see in litigation all the time, and I, I take some solace from that, is when people get really, really, really unreasonable, then people start pushing back. And so it will swing, but it just takes a long time. Yeah. And, and that's one thing I'd like to see more of because we truly have, you know, so much in common as Americans. And, and uh, fully agree with you. Yeah. We, There's we nothing just don't to be to fighting quibble. about. We should be pulling <laughs> right. together, for goodness sake. Right. Uh, especially in, in the times. Um, we love you, Diane. Oh, I think well, thank you're fantastic. You. Love you too. Uh, I, I look forward to continuing our friendship, and we just think you're great. We'll see you out at the track, I guess. I didn't Absolutely. know you got rid of the GT3. I'm kind of happy for you. Yeah, no, it's great. Because you yeah. can always get one again. Yeah, I, th- I don't I'm think good. you're going to I think it. I'll probably yeah. get a Cayman or something. Yeah, and you're digging something the, a little faster. Digging the mid engine now. Yeah. Well, we'll, we'll just see. We'll just see. <laughs> Leave your options open. It's all good, yeah. <laughs> this is a good first century kind of a, yeah. Uh, let's do one thing. What about, uh, are you on the social Larry. media? You're yes. on the social media, aren't you? Let's do a billboard segment here. <laughs> this is the segment of the show where Diane will tell us where we can find her. Let's see, what about social media or any way to keep up with you? Anything you've got going oh, on? Okay. Anything at all? I'm, a, I'm on Facebook, but I'm very judicious about who I let be my friend. And uh, But I can always be found at the firm. Uh, I'm at Quinn Emanuel, and uh, my email is dianecafrata at quinnemanuel.com. And I have a website there. And one thing to look for on my personal bio page is my article on going from a very fast car to a slow car. It's called Why I Sold My GT3 uh, for a Couple of Hamsters. Come and, on. <laughs> and, and it is, uh, I was asked by the San Diego Club to uh, write about my experience and what was important about it. And so anybody that's contemplating the I shift to a smaller, to, to, a, to a slower car can read this. I love it. I can't wait that's to read it. Awesome. That's fantastic. Oh, God. I just that's adore you. awesome. I just adore you. <laughs> and we're not alone. Everybody does. Uh, all right. Let's see. Mrs. Ryan, what do we have tomorrow? Jordan tomorrow, Brady. Tomorrow is Jordan Director. Brady. He's a director, and he used to be a comedian? Or Sometimes he does stand-up, Com- I'm told. Perfect. Producer, director, comedian. Love it. Uh, and then Thursday, we've got Martina Kwan, yeah. a female race car driver. Oh, you probably know Martina, right? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Awesome. Oh, love that'll it. be fun. Yeah. Mrs. Ryan, I love you so very much. Diane, we love you so very much. Oh, Thank you so much for being here. Love you Thank so you. Much. We love fun. everybody at home. Please love one another, and <laughs> we will see you all tomorrow with uh, Jordan Brady. <laughs> see you then. <laughs> That is so amazing. How did you-